Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. We move to a slightly different format for this session. My name is Ramesh Thakur. I'm a professor at the Australian National University, but I'm here in my capacity as the UNA Goodwill Ambassador for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, uh, which is slightly challenging these days because <laughs> contrary to the good news story we have had so far, for the first time that I can think of on this issue of nuclear disarmament, we find ourselves on the wrong side of the UN majority in relation to the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, I am not going to speak on that, and as often and not, although dual citizenship is a politically sensitive issue in this country now, <laughs> when I do speak on that treaty, I do reclaim my New Zealand citizenship rather than <laughs> Australia. <coughs> Given that we are living in interesting times on nuclear issues, what I thought I'll do is rather than speak about that now, if there is interest from the audience, we can include that as a topic in the Q&A and I will be happy to respond. So I don't want to impose my thoughts and views, but if there is interest, I'm happy to talk about that later. We have two speakers and there's a change, double change in that. Uh, firstly, for very important and understandable reasons, which is not always the case when we have dropouts at the last minute, uh, Jose Ramos Horta is unable to be present, and we will have a substitute for that, a speaker who will both speak on his behalf on some issues, but also make clear where she's speaking for herself rather than from him, for him uh, on, in other respects, uh, which leaves her the freedom to do exactly what she wants to do. <laughs> Not that it has stopped her before from doing what she wants to do. Uh, she will, secondly, the second change is she will actually speak second rather than first. Our first speaker, it gives me particular pleasure for a number of reasons, I won't take you through all the reasons, uh, is Dr. Marty Natalegawa. Uh, he did his PhD at the ANU, indeed in my former center, the Peace Research Center, on nuclear weapon-free zones. Uh, I also... Uh, ran into him a few times when he was the Indonesian permanent representative to the United Nations, and at that point I was a UN official. And of course he's gone on to bigger and better things uh, as foreign minister of Indonesia. So Marty, welcome back to Canberra, and please, we are all eager to listen to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I am del delighted to be here this afternoon, and I'm very grateful that the UNAA has decided it worthwhile to have me uh, amongst the uh, speaker uh, this morning and this afternoon. I, I must uh, begin, uh, of course, by congratulating the uh, United Nations Association of Australia for the tremendous work it has been doing over the past many years in developing uh, the constituency on the United Nations here at the United Na at, in Australia, uh, without which, uh, no doubt, Australia's uh, important contributions to the UN would not have been uh, possible. I wish as well to acknowledge uh, amongst us my uh, dear colleague and friend, Ambassador Cristiarto, who has just uh, assumed his post not too long ago, who would be far more uh, authoritative to speak on behalf of Indonesia on the subject matter that I'm about to share my own personal and private uh, view, I mean, uh, in view as an individual. So all the difficult questions on Indonesia, please address to the ambassador, <laughs> because I'm past that now. Well, uh, dear friends and colleagues, um, as others have spoken earlier, the past uh, 70 years, we have been witness to uh, really a transform uh, milieu, a transform environment insofar as the uh, United Nations uh, is concerned. Without going through some of the examples, but I think we would be familiar with uh, several signposts in terms of the debilitating impact of the Cold War, 
its end, which for some time brought some promise of better cooperation within the UN, and other forces that had been with us over the past 70 years, including the birth of new states. More than events, more than occurrences that we can no doubt all uh, have our own uh, description of what had transpired over the past 70 years, I'd like more to address by way of my, some of my introductory thoughts on the dynamics uh, that had been at play, that had been prominent in recent past. Uh, by dynamics, I mean here not simply geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts that have been occurring throughout the world. Because no doubt, many of you, all of you would be familiar with the reality of changing geopolitical pattern, the rise and the decline of states, whether it be politically or economically. But beyond the geopolitics and the geoeconomic changes, I wish to alert ourselves to a number of other uh, dynamics, which I think has a particular import on the way the United Nations conduct its work. A number of convergences or a number of forces which I think are of relevance. One, I think, is the reality increasingly that the national, the local, national, regional, and global are essentially one. It's very difficult for someone like myself who had some 30 years of practice in diplomacy to acknowledge and to accept the reality as if there is very faint or very fragile distinction between national and international. Because we work on the assumption that there are domestic issues, internal issues, and there are external issues of international relations. But I have come to increasingly believe that in reality, uh, the distinction between local, national, and global issues are becoming increasingly a faint one, a fragile one and that this is a reality that we must acknowledge and assume in the way we conduct our affairs. Another reality which I think is of some relevance is the fact the, of the traditional distinction between political, economic, and social issues are becoming ever more blurred. Of course, such distinctions are reflected in the way the United Nations itself work. Because within the UN, we are familiar with the delineation between peace and security issues, between development and human rights issues. But actually, uh, in my view and in my experience, the reality is the matters of politics, economics, social and cultural issues are one and the same, increasingly. Having mentioned these convergences, which suggests, therefore, we are more coherent and cohesive and united even. And we have seen recent evidences of what can be achieved if, if countries in the world work in a true spirit of cooperative partnership. The SDG, the Climate Change Accords, are only the most recent ex illustration of what can be achieved if countries actually uh, work together in a spirit of partnership. Unfortunately, as we have listened throughout this morning, the trends are not as uh, optimistic as we, had, uh, we can hope for. We are seeing, despite these convergences between national, local, local, national, regional, and global between issues, we are seeing a world probably less united than before. We are seeing, on the one hand, the promise of uh, connectivity in terms of technology, and yet uh, a world that is less connected because we are seeing evidence of greater intolerance, extremist views, and less understanding of the other. I think this gap between the reality of a, more, a world that is converging uh, because of forces that I had mentioned but at the same time, 
a world that is becoming more divisive beyond description of events, I think it's a climate or environment that we must factor into account when we discuss the United Nations. United Nations peace operation is no doubt facing a very challenging environment. Uh, no doubt today and tomorrow we'll be listening to many of those type of challenges and many of them are actually technical in nature. Resources constraint, uh, mandate issues, the issues uh, such as force configuration, uh, the fine line between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. Uh, these are issues that can consume uh, many of us for, for endless hours in trying to dissect and to understand the nature of the problem. We are also familiar, uh, not too long ago, of the uh, stresses and tensions between unilateralism on the one hand and multilateralism on the other. But I'd like to bring your attention to what I think is far more fundamental challenge than the issue of resources constraint, even than the issue of multilateralism versus unilateralism. And this is the issue and the challenge, I believe, signs of a retreat of diplomacy. Increasingly, we are seeing uh, throughout the world, which is not unusual, states being having disagreements, because we can't expect states to be always in agreement. But not only are they in disagreements, but the way they conduct themselves suggests as if diplomacy as a craft, as a profession, as an approach is becoming less and less prominent. Whether it be on the situations on the Korean Peninsula and other situation, conflict situations, uh, messages are being conveyed not by words, not by diplomatic words, but by deployment of military assets. Signals are being sent by means which are prone to misunderstanding, to misperception of leaders speaking with less sense of leadership than they ought perhaps to possess. I am rather concerned of that trend because I think this goes to the heart of diplomacy. Diplomacy is not a gift, as someone had said, but actually it must come to the fore when challenges are abound, not to actually to retreat and to become less prominent. I am especially concerned that the United Nations itself somehow has become the microcosm of the divisions in our world. I know the United Nations is not a supranational organization. It is not meant to be of that nature. It is an organization made up of sovereign states. But it troubles me sometimes when we see situations such as on the Korean Peninsula, the dynamics, the divisions are simply replicated at the United Nations. Day in, day out, we have this vicious cycle of an incident which is responded to collectively and rightly by the Security Council, and we can guarantee those requirements will be ignored, and there will be a new series of sanctions or other force measures. But somewhere down the line, this vicious cycle must be broken. And I'm not sure where, who can take that initial step. In a world where to be thinking outside the box, to be trying to build bridges, is seen to be an act of weakness that you are being held accountable for, especially within your own domestic constituencies. That is why in the remaining part of my remarks, I'd like to talk about the political dynamics to everything that we are doing. Because when we speak of peace operations by the United Nations, whether it be 
peacekeeping, which is obviously self-evidently important, but also special political mission, good offices, mediation initiatives. In the final analysis, these are all political processes. They are not technical issues alone. In particular, I'd like to bring forth to the discussion an issue, an issue that I think not many people would like to acknowledge. The fact that among states and within states, there is an inherent and inbuilt reticence, reluctance to bring their troubles, their issues before the United Nations. I am not trying to be politically incorrect because uh, there is the charter that uh, all the chapter seven and the like, chapter six. But the reality, I think, member states of the United Nations do not wish for their problems to be brought before the UN. It's easy for us to pontificate and to ask others to do certain things, but when it impact on ourselves, then I think that kind of reticence comes to the fore. In other words, I believe to be effective, the United Nations in its peace operations, it must confront this trust deficit. We must make it normal. We must make it quite regular for countries to bring their issues to the United Nations. The United Nations of universality of membership give its strength in terms of legitimacy. But at the same time, it causes reticence and concerns by member states of multilateralizing their issues. If you have a problem, you want to contain it as a national issues, but if it's brought to the UN, there is hesitance, there is concern, there will be such a weight of international public attention that this country will lose control of the discussion. I believe that to be meaningful and to be effective, this trust deficit, the root causes, must be properly addressed. I don't have an answer, uh, so please uh, don't expect me to give an answer. I am good at uh, identifying questions, hopefully. <laughs> but I think one level or one cluster that, is, would, that could be useful would be at the regional level. Often case, the region, not always, as we see on the issue of Syria, for example, the region can provide the type of comfort level that can bridge the national and the global. But for this to occur, the region must not be found wanting. The region must have a script. The region must be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We in Southeast Asia, we have tried, and I have to emphasize that this is only an effort just yet, not quite uh, uh, resounding success, but we, at least the way I had thought about it over the past 30 years, systematically and purposefully and deliberately sought to empower the regional level capacity. Not at the expense of the United Nations, but rather to become a strong partner of the United Nations. But this is a process that requires constant, continuous nurturing, investing, and developing. Waging peace in our region. In Southeast Asia, in 1976, we had the TAC, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, that basically states that countries of the region are not supposed to conduct themselves or resolve problems by use of force. That was quite uh, game-changing in terms of dynamics, but since then, we had to constantly nurture the spirit, especially post-1998 Indonesia, post-reformasi. Countless occasions, 
when Indonesia, and I have to say I've been party to such an effort, deliberately and purposefully, without anyone asking, without anyone expecting, let alone demanding, we bring to the ASEAN discussion all our problems. This is post-1998, post-Timor-Leste. Whether it be on Papua, on Aceh, on Maluku, on Sampit, all the troubles that we can imagine in Indonesia, we bring it on to the ASEAN discussion. And I have to say, most of the responses was awkward silence because none of the ASEAN countries wanted to hear that. But we press on because we wish to change the dynamics. We want to make sure that henceforth, our region will feel comfortable to compare notes, to acknowledge we have problems, and therefore have a common solution. We did not earn ASEAN support when we had the difficult years of East Timor. We simply expected support, but never really, in ASEAN, discuss and earn that support. Hence, the quality of support was of certain nature. We took lessons learned, and we actively sought to change the dynamics. Some examples are more promising than others since the Thailand-Cambodia border issues in 2011 when a conflict actually broke, it broke out between the countries, shootings occurred, people became, fell victims. The Security Council deliberated in February 2011, but we had an ASEAN script. We weren't in the Security Council as a troubled region, but we came already with a proposed solution. Hence, the Security Council rallied around ASEAN, basically to say, get on with it, and then we will continue to lend support. Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar's democratic process as well. The original democratic, the issue of reform in Myanmar. At the time, the Security Council was divided between P3 and P2, Russia and China on the one hand, United, United States, United Kingdom, and France on the other. Indonesia happened to sit in the council then, in the beginning of 2007. The first few weeks, we had a resolution to adopt, and Indonesia abstained, essentially, at the time, conceding um, that we are a little bit in a, in, a, in a neither here nor there spot. We worked on it. We took the initiative, and since then, we had an ASEAN script on Myanmar. When Cyclone Nargis occurred in 2008, post-tsunami 2004 in Indonesia, Myanmar shut down. They wished not to have international cooperation because, again, of that distrust. ASEAN stepped in to become the bridge between the wider international community and that country concerned. In other words, whilst not perfect and whilst not automatic, I believe that trust deficit can be bridged by the region. We are seeing today in Myanmar, unfortunately, once again, the problem uh, in relation to the Rohingyas. I am saddened, and I, have, I, will, I, will, I will be not too diplomatic in saying this, I am saddened by the complete, almost, almost complete lack of ASEAN discourse on this issue. Just yesterday, the Security Council met on the issue. In a few days' time, leaders around the world will congregate in New York, deafening silence by ASEAN. This is not very, very useful. And it requires leadership by countries of the region, by Indonesia in particular, to bring forth an ASEAN position around which the United Nations can rally. What is happening in Myanmar 
is not without precedence. Indonesia, when we began our reform journey, 99, 98, 2000, we were also at the time immediately struck by multidimensional crisis. The Maluku, Maluku Aceh, the, the remaining issues from Timor Leste, East Timor, Sampit, disintegration forces, critical juncture. Do we go left or right? We chose the democratic response, greater autonomy for the regions. I think Myanmar now is facing the same type of juncture. Would it wish to have an apparent quick fix of suppression, or would it try to find a solution in the democracy that it, has now, it is now enjoying? Dear friends and colleagues, uh, by way of conclusion, or concluding thoughts, what I had wanted to bring forth to the discussion is to remind that in the final analysis, United Nations peace operation, whether from peacekeeping to special political missions, mediation, etc., are inherently political process. It is not only about resources, about mandates and, and force configuration and the like, extremely important, but those are the implementing uh, uh, phases of the nature of the problem. Most of all, I believe that the, the type of gap that I try to highlight must be addressed. Countries that have problems or challenges must be ma made at ease in bringing a matter to the United Nations. I sat in the Security Council twice in my career because Indonesia served at the Council twice. And I know how lengthy and how deliberative it can be even to have an, uh, an issue brought to the agenda of the United Nations. Diplomats are trained to speak endlessly for many, many hours, months, and even years, give us a piece of paper, and we can go on and on and on <laughs> and on. Uh, but there is reticence to have an issue brought to the United Nations because of the implications it suggests. Some of the issues, I remember as a council member, we tried to clear up some of the dormant issues, issues that are no longer discussed within so many decades or years. But even then, it was impossible to delete an issue because the sponsor, the original sponsor of an issue, feel that this is a point to be made by having an issue in the portfolio of the United Nations Security Council. I believe this kind of schism, this kind of uh, distrust must be breached. I have no answer, as I said, but I thought that one potential uh, element is the regional element. But it's not a panacea, there's only one, but you must, we must think of some more uh, possible solutions to address this gap. Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and Australia, I was looking forward to having my good friend and brother, uh, Ramos Horta, uh, amidst us, of course, but he has other pressing issues. Our three countries represent what can have occur with the right type of leadership. East Timor, we all have different interpretation of the past. East Timor have its own, Australia have its own, Indonesia have its own. And I think it won't be a useful exercise to look back and to try to, um, uh, you know, I mean, second guess what had happened in the past. But as soon as we were where we were, we were our leaders, Shanana Guzmao, Ramos Horta, President SBY and the like, look forward. We became closer, closer, more, closer than ever before. And Australia as well. One thought that I wanted to, one development I wanted to highlight. When Timor-Leste was still being administered by Antayet, I hope I'm not mistaken in terms of sequence. We in Indonesia initiated a trilateral forum 
Indonesia, Australia, at the time, untied because there was not yet a fully uh, governing administration in, of the independent East Timor, Timor Leste. The point being, we, are, we wish to see issues that are common to us becomes issues that binds us rather than divides us. And we continued that process when Timor Leste um, became an independent state. We had the trilateral Indonesia, Australia, Timor Leste cooperation, Timor Leste taking over from the Antaid. I hope this kind of trilateral format is continued. I know that often case uh, officials and ministers are terribly busy, but this trilateral format, I think, is too important to be allowed to decay. Uh, because what it represents, Timor Leste becomes a country that unites Indonesia, Australia, and Timor Leste in one common endeavor. But the main point, I think, there is that political dynamics, political leadership is the key issue, uh, not resource wherewithal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. And of course, the United Nations played an indispensable role in binding the three countries together through that trauma and the crisis. And I think that is worth recalling as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all of you who have had anything to do with ASEAN diplomats and ministers will recognize in the address we've just had the gravitas, the depth of experience, and the sophistication of analysis and understanding of problems. And on top of that, we are privileged to have an unusually honest and candid assessment of past and present critical problems like Myanmar and East Timor. Uh, which takes me to our next speaker, who is Janelle Safin, a lawyer by training, a former member of parliament, of Australia's parliament, with whom I spent several days once in Myanmar, including six hours of cycling from sunrise to noon <laughs> with a 1920s vintage cycle where my brakes didn't work and I had to use my legs as my brakes. <laughs> and I recall at the end of that one of my favorite photographs from that trip as we stopped for some much needed food and much welcomed beer. I took a photo of Gareth Evans and Janelle Seffin each devoted to what they do a lot of, Gareth spread out his map and was intently studying the map, and Janelle was busy on her cell phone. <laughs> Janelle's two passions for many, many years as issues, as an individual person, as a member of parliament, as a lawyer working on human rights and social justice issues, have been Myanmar and East Timor. She's spent long times in, and periods in both these countries. She knows all the major actors uh, very well and very personally. And so given the unanticipated and unexpected circumstances which has kept our billboard speaker off the panel, uh, I think we are very fortunate to have in his stead, Janelle, would you please welcome her? Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh, and I'm sure I could entertain you for the whole time I've got to speak about that trip we had um, in Myanmar, <laughs> even the six hours on the bicycles. And Gareth loves maps and planning, and he'd say, we go this way, and I'd say, no, Gareth, I think we go this way. And after we'd gone the wrong way following Gareth, he'd say, I think we should go back that way, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it was it was an interesting trip, but it was for work, so it was doing uh, good work on the non-proliferation of nuclear um, weapons and that. Now, 
Jose would say at the outset a big thank you to um, Major General Mike Smith, UNAA. He really did want to be here to support the UNAA and he showed that support um, more recently when the ACT chapter of the UNAA had their um, annual dinner and he came as the guest. So um, I'm speaking... He said, you do it, you do it. And of course, he didn't give me a note. <laughs> just speak for me. But he and I have had a long history together. And I'll just recount a little um, for people here who don't know. Um, I've worked as his principal advisor. I've lived in um, East Timor, Timor-Leste or Timor-Timor, and um, Timor-Lorisai, four names. <laughs> and uh, so I've lived there, worked there. I've been his spokeswoman at different times. We've done a lot together and um, I can channel him quite well when I need to. <laughs> what I can't do is speak five languages, <laughs> don't have his accent, but I'm very familiar with I tell you, so <laughs> one of his favourite sayings. And I was thinking, you know, what would he say? Um, and I was actually thinking of Michael Kirby, Justice Michael Kirby. He published that lovely little book about what would Gandhi do in these circumstances. And I always think, what would Jose do? When I talk about him, I call him JRH. So that's how I talk about him, write about him. What would JRH do? And um, what would he say on regional perspectives on... Um, peacekeeping. And one of the things I know he'd say, he'd say a big thank you to Ian Martin here. Um, like, um, Jose and Ian are like UN royalty is the best way I can say it. Ian's sort of raising his eyebrows at me in alarm. And <laughs> they um, are connected with the United Nations family. They're part of it, going in and going out like Ian does. Um, they uh, see it at its best make it better, improve it, um, not frightened to critique it when it's at its worst, but recognise the absolute seminal importance of a rules-based international order and having the UN and making it work better. Jose did want to talk about um, HIPPO and um, the high-level independent panel on peace operations. Ian was a member of that panel because he always says yes, you know, to things like, yes, 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 I'll talk on that. And then he talks on what he likes. But I said to him, you must do a bit on regional perspectives and I'll do some on the HIPPO. He used to say to me, HIPPO, and I'd say, no, it's HIPPO. So <laughs> commonly called HIPPO. I do want to pick up um, and he really was apologetic not being here with Marty because they were like, the apart from Minister Julie Bishop, whom Jose would thank for her contribution and leadership as Foreign Minister of Australia, he really did want to be here with his friend um, Marty. And he asked me to extend um, his apologies, uh, Marty, for not being with you. And just listening to what Marty said about that point, and this is reflecting also Timor-Leste and Jose and some of my thinking, that uh, member states are reluctant to put their issues before the United Nations. And it's actually, I had a note here saying Timor-Leste weren't and they weren't reluctant to put it for the, before the United Nations, but some of that comes from their very singular and unique experience of... Um, the years of occupation, but even more of that, because when um, the popular consultation had taken place and they were getting ready to take over the reins of governance, you know, self-determination and all of that, there would be an internal debate and a lot of people want the UN to get out as quickly as possible because they want to prove this is, you know, we're sovereign, this is my country, this is my nation, we're political leaders, we can do this, and they weren't reluctant. And I was thinking of how long the various... The UN's still there in, you know, with certain positions, but it was 1999 until I think the end of 2012. Ian's nodding at me, so... <laughs> and they, that they were there. And one of the things that um, Jose used to do, he'd have to go and argue to the UN for a mission to be extended, for them to stay there. And when he did that, 
I remember he always used to say, and at the Security Council, he'd say, look, you've given us a short time. If you set up a delicatessen in New York City, it takes you two years just to get organised. And he'd make comments like that in the Security Council and he'd say, how can you expect us to build a state, build a state architecture in that short time? And I think... Um, I hadn't thought about it in the way you were saying it, Marty, but I had had written down that they weren't reluctant and had frequently put themselves before the United Nations and sort of let, you know, exposed everything. But not everybody wants to do that. And um, the other point I just wanted to pick up on was when you talked about Myanmar, I was opining where ASEAN was at the moment in... Um, what what is happening in Myanmar? Uh, I'm I publish on Myanmar. I've done it with Jose Ramos Horta and also with Kevin Rudd this week on what's happening and um, also uh, defending Aung San Suu Kyi in you know things that are happening there at the moment. But I was thinking, where is ASEAN? And I was thinking about that today, thinking on regional perspectives on peacekeeping and. What I've seen is ASEAN uh, countries with different sort of perspectives and issues and engagement on that particular issue, but I haven't seen ASEAN um, come together as ASEAN to have a common sort of view, whereas, as you rightly said, on Cyclone um, Nagas, um, they clearly played a very good role in bringing the international community into um, Myanmar where they were very scared of having foreigners um, come in. Now, a couple of things that, um, on regional perspectives, one of the things that I know Jose would say was that with the missions in Timor-Leste and starting with um, the, well, the 5th of May agreement and um, then... Uh, he would say that what it did was it it was actually it brought in a lot of neighbours countries from the region into those various missions that hadn't really been so involved before. And um, there was China, there was the Philippines, there was the um, Thais who led the peacekeeping, three Thai generals, Major General Mike Smith was the 2IC um, with the peacekeeping there and there are a whole range of regional actors and involved in that and increasingly you're seeing more of that in peacekeeping worldwide and um, even Singapore uh, as well but you know I can't remember all the countries but there are a lot of them and it was interesting watching um, that development and I know that um, Jose would say 1999 happened because of the international community but also because of the good sense and the goodwill of um, the neighbours Indonesia agreeing to the May agreements and then agreeing to the offers of assistance post the popular consultation um, for the missions that then followed and with Interfet uh, and the Untayet and those missions. So I know that he would say that and I want to say that on his behalf. And all of the, and there were many missions in um, Timor Leste, in East Timor, and they were all able to contribute. The one thing Jose would say, it's hard to reflect on regional perspectives because all peacekeeping missions primarily are the international peacekeeping missions and they may operate with regional flavour, regional differences, but they're within that international framework. And I... The experience that um, José had from 1975 to 1999, which is a rather unique experience as a young man, 1975, December, he found himself before the Security Council, not really knowing what it was, and arguing the case for um, East Timor, the independence of East Timor. 
And he stayed doing that until 1999 and he lived out of his country um, all of that time. And as he said, he, he reckons he earned five PhDs in the UN in that time <laughs> and the international community, which he sometimes sort of refers to in inverted commas, who are they? <laughs> and talking about the international community. And then he had the experience when he went back home, 1999, and up until particularly 2012 with the peacekeeping missions, with the political missions, and then come to 2015, was it, Ian, the hippo? 14, 15? 14, 2014. And he chaired that high-level independent panel reviewing peace operations. So he had a wealth of experience to bring to the table um, with that. And that would have been about the fourth big report. I mean, there's been many, but the fourth big report on peace operations, I think the one before it would have been the Brahimi report in 2000. That was a seminal report. And so is this um, Hippo one. And there were just four things about it, and it was really um, what the recommendations were. Are you talking about it, Ian, tomorrow? <laughs> I don't, I'm just going to say a couple of things because it's really important and we've heard it here today and just heard it again from Marty and it's about politics and politics is often missing from peacekeeping operations whether they be regional or however you want to characterise them and it's not just that they're missing it's almost like sometimes it's a deliberate missing in action because that's got nothing to do with... Um, peacekeeping, politics is politics, peacekeeping is peacekeeping, military is military, police is police, keep them all separate. And the reality is it's politics that drives it. Conflict, where does it come from? <laughs> A range of factors. Politics, how do we fix it? Politics. And I always say the same group you see who've primarily been at the helm where the conflict has erupted are the same group you end up with around the table to resolve it. I generally do say men in suits. Ramos Horton might not say that. So <laughs> I would generally say that's, you know, what you see. But it is politics. And so there were four essential shifts that um, the Hippo report identified for peacekeeping, which he would have talked about in detail. First one, politics must drive the design and implementation of peace operations. Second, the full stream of UN peace operations must be used more flexibly, so a bit more flexibility, to respond to changing needs on the ground, not just be locked into the mandate that somebody mentioned this morning. One of, I think, the historian. Third, a stronger, more inclusive peace and security partnership is needed for the future. And I think that brings in very nicely, segues into what Marty was talking about with the regional um, perspectives as well. Fourth, the UN Secretariat must become more field focused and UN peace ops must be more people centred. And for me, that just brings in a whole lot of um, civil military, all sorts of ways of responding uh, very differently in the field. And I just a, a couple of other things that um, he would say. He would say something about the SDGs and to Mike's some um, pleasure, he would talk about SDG 16, <laughs> which is peace, justice, strong institutions. And it is really um, a telling SDG in this space of peacekeeping. And I can say that Mike and I spent a week teaching at Yangon University Law Department and we did. Mine was primarily rule of law, Mike's primarily SDG and SDG 16, but we overlapped and linked up. And it was really interesting how we were able to bring that together because in the, uh, the literature that exists, they're not really linked up. So we, we had to do that. And it was, it was a good way um, of bringing it into the rule of law and what's going on as well in Myanmar. I also, I'll finish here, Ramesh, because then um, we agreed on a certain time and I think I've taken it. And one of the things I wanted to say, and I did say it to Bruce Armstrong from Aspen, 
I thank Bruce Armstrong and Aspen for saving the life of José Ramos Horta. And I told Bruce Armstrong the story the morning that José got shot when it was an attempted assassination. It was my first day in federal parliament. And so I'm walking in all happy, you know, <laughs> isn't this nice? And um, I got a phone call and it was Janelle, José's been shot and um, my knees actually buckled for a second. And then I thought, OK, what do I do? And I said, where is he? How much blood has he lost? Stop the flow of blood, sit on him, do whatever, get him to Aspen right now. And they were going to take him to the Dilly National Hospital, wonderful hospital. I've been treated there. I go there. But I said, get him to Aspen. And they'd just um, uh, done what they call hot blood. That's you put your arm out, the blood goes out straight into the person who needs it. They just worked on that the week before with our Australian soldiers. They hot-blooded it into José and it saved his life. So I, I thank Bruce for that. <laughs> and I, um, this afternoon at four o'clock, José will become a senior cabinet minister. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle, for stepping in so promptly and so effectively. That nice blend of personal and professional reflections. The floor is open for questions to our panelists. What I suggest we do is take three questions at a time, and that gives us opportunity to get more questions in. It also gives the speakers a bit of time to reflect on the answers they might have for you. Uh, and then depending on how much time we have, we'll go through to the scheduled time. So if you'd please identify yourself and identify the speaker to whom your question is directed. Someone? They've been very, yes, please. So it's difficult to be the first one. Um, I've asked this so many times before. The role of media, I mean, what we're learning now is all, it, most of it is new to me. I mean, what, what we learn mostly is we, what we learn from media. And, and what they publish is not really to be trusted in a way because it's all sort of one sided or sided the other way. How do you, how do you make sure? that we get the true story. Does anyone else wish to follow up? Because if there are not going to be three questions, we will go to the... Yes, uh, to one there and one there. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm James from ANU. I'm just a student. Um, question was sort of to both of you on the topic of Myanmar. Um, I just know that it is sort of one of the most culturally diverse countries um, sort of in, on the globe. And uh, given the autonomous region to Rohingya, which is sort of maybe one of the solutions for those people, um, I was just wondering if your thoughts of whether that sort of threatens a chain reaction to a lot of other cultural uh, entities throughout that uh, country, uh, and whether then the government will lose control of a lot of region, uh, and whether they'd be willing to do that, or whether that would just not be a possibility into the future. Thank you. And a third question from here. Yeah, hi. My name is Mark Fry. I'm with the AFP. Um, uh, with the one point I'd just like to raise, maybe get a comment on, is when we were planning, we were going back in in 2006 into Timor after the rioting. I believe the UN had only just sort of, uh, to a large extent, packed up, and there was a lot of uh, positive assessments that it was all stable. I think around December 20, 20, 2005, and a couple of months later, then all of a sudden. No, everyone went back in. Mm. So it's just uh, quite interesting your comment there about Ronald Swarna saying it takes two years to set up a deli. <laughs> and I just thought the UN had largely packed up, but then everyone had to go back in and it extended through to 2012. So maybe a comment around that, mm -hmm. that issue of packing up, but then was it really that stable? OK, and we'll take those, yeah. take those through. Yeah. Marty, why don't you say? Jenna, you want to say? Yeah. 
<laughs> There's some serious bilaterals well, going on there. Thank you. In my... Well, anyway, uh, in my previous uh, work as a spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whenever there is a rather difficult question posed, I think my answer would simply be, that's a very good question. <laughs> and and I, I'll leave it at that without trying to even to begin to respond. But the first question about the role of media, if I may just try to relate it to the topic at hand, which is mediation, rather than role of media in a, in a, in a more uh, general sense. I'm afraid I, what I say could be politically incorrect uh, at a time when it's supposed to be the age of transparency, um, where everything is real time, the age of social media, and the like. Um, from my perspective, if one is dealing with a mediation setting uh, where agreements are being sought, where parties need to be as open as possible in sharing their respective position and trying to identify where convergences may exist or not exist. Uh, having at the same time like a real-time constant uh, uh, public exposure of what is transpiring is often not the most helpful because then the uh, negotiators or the mediators or the, the parties uh, may not necessarily be truly actually conversing with one another, but rather actually addressing their home domestic constituencies. So in my experience, uh, sometimes I feel, of course, it's very extremely important to develop constituencies, support, sense of ownership in whatever you are undertaking. But there comes certain time when uh, you know, the mediation efforts, the political process uh, efforts, must be allowed to take place in certain conditions conducive, where constant uh, second guessing can actually be uh, not necessarily productive to the process. Uh, apart from that thought, what I wanted to share as well is this notion that um, now I'm not talking of the media in the traditional sense, but the social media, um, the uh, advent of uh, new technologies, the digital technologies, in a way, we have like um, the paradox of plenty. You know, people are, we have more information, uh, but people are not necessarily more informed. Uh, not because of the, the information are false. Uh, I'm not saying like uh, hoax news. Uh, it's in Indonesia at the moment, it's a, a big thing about this hoax uh, news and hoax information. I'm not saying factually incorrect, but simply that people tend to refer to uh, information and views that are in keeping with their own prejudices. So we have uh, a silo mentality. Uh, people hearing but not listening and then basically more information, but not, necessar not necessarily more informed. But it is uh, the reality under which, uh, in which diplomats must conduct uh, their trade, and, and therefore they must adapt and adjust accordingly. But I wouldn't want to have uh, the media or, or pressures to, to appear in certain way to, do, to, do, to be the main determinant in the way one conducts oneself in mediation. And just very quickly on the Rohingya, because I will, I will leave uh, the other question, uh, I will not address that issue. On the Rohingya issue, I'm, I'm obviously not an expert on, on Myanmar, uh, and I won't pretend to be. Uh, but I can only speak a little bit of it about Indonesia, as I had alluded to earlier. Because Indonesia is not unlike Myanmar in terms of its, its diversity in terms of its tradi the traditional role of the armed forces in the past uh, in its, uh, in its uh, governance system. Uh, but when we reform, when we began the reform process in 98, 99, concurrently there was also similar pressures from the different ethnic groups uh, uh, that potentially could have uh, torn the country apart. But the re response was actually more autonomy uh, because the concurrent with the democratization was actually greater autonomy for the regions. So we preempt we, uh, the tendency, the dynamics, 
and to such an extent that we are where we are. But uh, in the case of uh, Myanmar, it's extremely complex, uh, defying simple solutions. I've been to the Rakhine state. Uh, I've been uh, amongst those affected populations. But from Indonesia's vantage point uh, of the past experience, I think this is time when Myanmar needs strong encouragement uh, more rather than isolation. Because uh, when we were going through that, those difficult moments, we needed our uh, international partners uh, to support us. But for that to be forthcoming, you have to, be, you have to show actually a real commitment to, to do the right thing. You can't have it both ways. You can't expect support without actually doing uh, you know, the things that you, you expected to if you are a democratic uh, state, so to speak. Thank you. Um, on the first one, the role of the media, it's, it's always a, a bit complex, but communications is vital, and it's just part and parcel of life, whether um, in any public role particularly that you play. And some people hide from it, and there's no point hiding from it. It's better to embrace it, understand it, and work with it. And I'm speaking probably as a politician as well, but, you know, with experience. But I do see some people um, hide from it and think that it will just go away and I'll be left alone. That doesn't happen. So engage with it. Um, social media, a lot of it's a fact of life, you know, get used to it and um, work out how best to deal with it and live with it and engage with it. Um, all the various platforms and you know there's a lot of talk about fake news and hoax news and all of that and there is of course some of that going on but hasn't that always gone on? I don't think that's new. It's just become new with I think Trump's made it more, President Trump I should say, has made it more, um, more new or more of an issue but it's always happened and there's always been propaganda and I think that Communications is really vital, but as Marty said, in different situations, there's a right to know, and sometimes with journalists you've been involved with for a long time, you can brief them, and they're not going to go and publish it until parties are ready for that to be published, and you can work out ways of working with them. So that's my comment on media. I'm not sure if it answers you completely. <laughs> but... The second one, <clears throat> in answer directly to the question, James, I don't see that as possible, feasible, thinkable <laughs> in Myanmar, Burma as it is. Um, the, the historical narratives that are, being con that are contested in Rakhine State with the Arakan and with the Rohingya or Bengalis, as they say, because even the word Rohingya is not used in in Burma, and um, and there's the and everyone in Arakan has been oppressed at some stage, and by the central um, government and by the military. So and you know, 1962, um, it w it's been run from military basically since then uh, because of these contestations around ethnic nationalities and identities. So. I can't see anyone even discussing it. I think to discuss it would be heresy. <laughs> and, you know, I've published on this, the ethnic nationalities and the whole issue. And <clears throat> Marty called it a democracy. It's a disciplined democracy, a partial democracy, and the military um, are constitutionally mandated to run the three big ministries of defence, immigration, border affairs, home affairs, and the whole country is administered under home affairs, general administration department. So it's a, it's a hybrid democracy, but I agree with Marty, we need to not retreat, um, condemn heinous human rights abuses, but I think we should back off Su Chi a bit at the moment. She's the shield for the military at the moment, and we could back off. And she set up the commission to implement the Anan Commission recommendations. I think we, the international community, ASEAN, could kick in behind it.
Thank you. Thanks very much. The time for another oh, three. Do you want to, or do you want to keep it for the next round? Next one. Your question. The AFP. Yeah. I better answer the Go AFP. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yes, being on the ground, it was clear that there were the tensions that existed, um, whether it would erupt in the way it did on the 25th of May. I'm not sure everybody predicted that, but there was clearly, I was there, so there was clearly um, uh, that tension that existed. It had been building up and hadn't been quite resolved between the police and the army. I mean, there are other factors, but that was just a reality. Um, the UN mission was to go in May that year, if I remember correctly. It extended till August. And um, and it, it, it actually shocked people because everybody saw Timor-Leste as a great success story from the UN. You know, the international community, great success story. Everyone took pride in it. You know, if I was at the UN, where are you working? What are you doing? Everyone took pride. So it was a shock, but it did shock the nation too. But if you looked at the statistics, within five years, most conflict nations do go back into conflict, a lot of them. And um, there hadn't been any planning or thinking about it. There had been some planning in Australia, so <laughs> there was some predictability about it. Ian came in at that time too, um, after, well, he was there in 1999, set up the popular consultation, then he came back that year as well and did the review as, yeah. And so we can have that longer discussion, and if you like. I can give you a lot more detail. <laughs> and my memory is that the UN mission on the ground actually recommended against closing it down, saying it would be a bit premature. The reaction at headquarters was, yes. these guys are just wanting to extend their jobs. <laughs> uh, so there, there's lots of things there. Let's take another three questions. Uh, the lady there, there was someone else in the middle there, if I remember rightly. No? Okay. And then I'll come to the front. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you to both speakers. My name's Leanne Smith. I am the um, recently appointed director of the Whitlam Institute and the outgoing head of policy and best practice for UN peacekeeping. Um, as this panel that we have this afternoon is about uh, regional perspectives on UN peace operations, I wondered whether um, we might raise in this session, it seems best place, the, the concept of regional contributions to UN peacekeeping. And I know it's not something either of you spoke about, but maybe we could just put it out there for the, for the rest of the discussion. Um, as many of you would know that in, as part of the UN's efforts to increase um, contributions to UN peacekeeping, one effort has been around seeking reg regional formulations of, of assets, people, training to put together as a package um, that's worked in some parts of the world. So I guess I'm wondering what prospects people see for that kind of collaborative cooperation towards a contribution to peacekeeping in our region. Um, and at the Whitlam Institute, we're interested in this idea in terms of Australia's national interests from the perspective of um, this being a way to enhance and enrich our regional relationships in a long-term way, and also as a way of um, meeting our obligations to support and contribute to multilateralism. So, so if anyone has any thoughts on that, that'd be great. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, since you're from the Whitlam Institute, and Martin mentioned the fact about new states being created, there's that lovely statement from Goff, Comrade, they're creating states faster than I can visit them. Uh, Harold. <laughs> Harold Wilkinson from the United Nations Association. <clears throat> Dr. Nathal Gatwa, I'd like to, uh, I was really intrigued about your uh, thought coming to the point of being prepared to, to look at this whole issue of trust deficit and uh, how countries might be encouraged to uh, offer up some of their concerns to be considered in a broader context, particularly in a regional context. And uh, I do understand that you said you didn't have the answer, so I'm not pressing for an answer, but I'd like a little bit more of a conversation because in my mind this is very tied up with an internal in each country, an internal political discussion. Um, and then I come to the point of just suddenly recalling um, that we in Australia have a bit of a struggle at the moment with something called the Human Rights Commission, which comes out and offers some challenges and some ways of reinterpreting things that the government has decided. 
And that's encouraging an internal discussion that maybe helps us then become more able to have that discussion more broadly. I don't know. I, th I, I thought it was an important question to begin to think some more about. One more before we... Yes, in the middle there. Uh, hi, my name's Cosmos. My question's more about um, the United Nations and I guess reform within the, the United Nations to make it more effective at what it's trying to do. Marty spoke about the challenges of trying to clear up matters from many years ago that have been on the books for a long period of time. Um, we've heard about uh, challenges around the veto voting system. We've heard around challenges around in incentives or motivation of, of a small number of um, staff within the United Nations. Um, what, what, what's the conversation about reform? Um, um, how, how do we make it work better, given that it's the only thing that we actually have on a global basis to deal with these types of issues? Okay, General, you want to start this time? The, the first one on the regional contributions, um, I think it, it sounds like a nice idea, but I'm not sure what mechanism it would work through. You know, and where we're dialogue partners in the region, there's various ones, uh, ARF or ASEAN plus, you know, plus, 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 you know, and various other regional mechanisms, like how would we make it work? So I, you know, I always want to be open-minded about the idea of it, but I'm not sure how far we'd get with the practice of it and what percentages we'd want to do and how it would be used. So I'm probably just thinking too much of all the, the negatives and the problems <laughs> of it. I, you know, I can start to see it, but there's no reason not to have the conversation and start the dialogue around it and to try and, I suppose, bring us even closer together in the region and how we respond to um, conflict and, you know, in holistic ways and what we've been talking a little bit here about with Myanmar as well. So don't want to poo-poo such an idea, just have to think it through. And I'm sure you've probably got some thinking and written material on it now that I'll now look at. <laughs> and on the how to make the UN more effective, oh dear. Um, it's like that debate's been going on for a long time and uh, look, and there's a lot of people who've been involved in it, but... It's like government. It's not a government, but it's the all the governments come together and they do reform from time to time. Things do happen. It does improve. Um, I'm watching the new Secretary General start to roll out uh, some changes. The way I see it is he comes from a government, you know, being in control of his own country and it looks to me like he's sort of setting up cabinet processes that's how I that's how I see it I'm not sure how other people see it but I think some of the things he's trying to do might be useful in terms of how the UN will work better and his response to the hippo report um, and how the peacekeeping operations will work and it won't be implemented until 2019. If implemented, that's a good start too to reform. It's just, you know, Ian will answer that question far better than anyone tomorrow, I'm sure. So <laughs> ask again tomorrow. <laughs> Oops, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the first question on the regional uh, contribution to peacekeeping force. Actually, this is a subject matter that had been discussed within ASEAN. Uh, in 2002, when Indonesia launched the idea of ASEAN political security community, uh, one of its con constituent elements or idea was to have an ASEAN peacekeeping force. Um, the problem, to be honest, the, the idea was was immediately rejected. By the by the way, uh, but we had we made a mistake. Literally, when we were typing the proposal, we put capital P, capital K, and capital F, and everyone immediately got, got extremely uh, hesitant and sensitive about the notion of having some kind of a standing ASEAN peacekeeping force, like a supranational uh, type of uh, symbolism and, and the like. So that idea was immediately put to rest. 
So we began to talk in the ASEAN political security community of the idea of having an ASEAN peacekeeping capacities. Uh, in other words, we are, we are talking more of ASEAN's potential contribution to the United Nations and even for intra-regional uh, deployment. And here uh, we have had already a number of ASEAN peace peacekeeping centers uh, with nationally in Indonesia and Thailand and the like, where we have greater collaboration now uh, to develop uh, interoperability, to work with the United Nations in a more coherent and cohesive way, uh, working out on the, for example, issue of status of uh, forces agreement, a model status of forces agreement. So in other words, it is a process that we have begun uh, the conversation is out there, the notion of developing ASEAN's uh, capacity on peacekeeping, whether it be homegrown, I mean, for use in the region, or as part of a UN contribution to the United Nations. So it's not a completely ab absent subject matter. Uh, on a potentially related topic uh, during the 2002 period as well, Indonesia actually suggested to ASEAN member states that we should have a list of all the conflict situations in, in Southeast Asia. So we have a better prevention, uh, preemptive capacity. Uh, that idea was rejected as well. Uh, but, but there's no harm trying. That my motto is, it's better that we try. At least we draw lessons learned from our failure. But we, we did try to suggest to have a, a list of all the ASEAN disputes in Southeast Asia. But it was too highly politicized because sometimes countries don't wish to acknowledge that there is a border problem between them and another country. So that idea never took off. But we publish our own. Uh, Indonesia, again, one of those dynamic changing efforts, uh, we publish our own border disputes, uh, unresolved border issues. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, replicated. Uh, or it, it did not encourage others to do likewise. Uh, the second question on the trust deficit, I, I don't wish to uh, overemphasize or exaggerate the nature of the problem. But from what I experience, and uh, when you see at the United Nations, uh, you know, countries will be you know, extremely reluctant and reticent to have their issues brought before the United Nations. Uh, you know, the notion of having their portfolio, their issue, a threat to international peace and security or even, even more abstract, may constitute a threat to international peace security. It is a heavily contested notion. Uh, and yet we are talking of prevention. Uh, all our efforts are most supposed to be based on the idea of prevention, uh, managing potential conflicts. But uh, unless this uh, uh, gap is addressed, we will only know it when things become obvious. Uh, and if by then, it's probably too late. Uh, so I'm not trying to be less, you know, not, not pro-United Nations. I'm just describing how things are. Uh, and this is not a monopoly of authoritarian country or country A or country Everyone does it. I mean, uh, wh whatever it is on human rights, on, you know, when the United Nations Human Rights Council issues a report, on one of the more democratic, supposedly democratic, they are un unhappy as well. Mm -hmm. So I think this gap must be uh, addressed, must be recognized, and I, and I believe the regional organization potentially has a role. And, and lastly, on the um, issue of the UN working methods, and uh, those of us who's been at it for a while, uh, you know, especially Security Council reform, as you know very well, it has been ongoing and there hasn't been any uh, consensus on the issue of membership of the Security Council, for example. But I think there is still plenty of room for the working methods to be improved. Increasingly, I'm of the view, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, misnomer, a bit of an exaggeration, to assume that 15 member countries of the Security Council has all the wisdom that is necessary to solve all problems in the world. Honestly, for some countries in the Security Council, the, the elected members, the non, not the P5, they come in and out every two years. Many issues they would not have dealt with at the national level. They are reliant on the United Nations Secretary to provide them with all the information, which has been fantastically important. But yet there are countries outside the Council 
who could make meaningful contribution. But they are not formally a member of the Security Council, but yet they are outside the fence looking in. To me, that is a little bit of a missed opportunity. How can you have discussion on Myanmar, on Rohingya, for example, in a closed session of 15 countries? Some are more informed than others, and yet those who are probably far more informed than many of them are not even part of the conversation. I think the United Nations must develop a working method that is a bit more adaptive, a bit more pragmatic, and, and not be focused on the issue of membership in the traditional sense as if once you are in, you are forever in. Uh, that's why we have this ongoing debate on the Security Council per permanent members, new permanent members. But we should have a more issue-driven constellation. If the issue is A, then the country should be so. But uh, it's easier said than done. Uh, I was guilty of this uh, not being open-minded as I am now. When I was still in office, it's always easy to be of such orientation after it's all uh, behind you. But um, I do believe the working methods of the United Nations. You know, we have 21st century problems with 20th century governance and habits. Uh, I think the mindset must be somewhat made a bit more current uh, to, be, to be a bit more relevant. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Uh, those of you who know me will know that I like to speak in sets of three comments. Uh, let me bring the session to a close by making three comments. Firstly, on the question of regional uh, peacekeeping, I think we in the Asia Pacific have much to learn from this, on this from Africa, where they've gone further than any, any other region in having regional peacekeeping training centers, mm -hmm. having regional uh, peacekeeping capacities, as Marty was speaking, uh, in terms of uh, comparative advantage and mutual reinforcement rather than outright duplication. And they've even gone as far as trying to develop regional peacekeeping doctrines. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I think we need uh, to learn from and adapt uh, to our region, uh, which we haven't done. Uh, but that's part of a larger problem where Asia lags behind all other continents in terms of developing uh, region-wide architecture for looking at uh, particularly peace and security, but not limited just to peace and security issues. So that's the first comment. Uh, second comment, UN reform. Uh, many of you will not know it. Uh, I was Kofi Annan's principal writer for his second reform report. I think two things there. One, of course, you can always improve existing working methods and personnel practices and various forms. But in the UN context, I'm afraid a lot of this, uh, and, that, and the new Secretary General is also doing that, but a lot of this in the UN context is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> the big reform, which is most urgently and critically needed, is that of the Security Council. <laughs> that is the reform that ain't going to happen. Not in my lifetime, maybe not even in God's lifetime. <laughs> uh, and to make the point, I like to say that there are 10 elected members and five unelected members. And that is very important, because politically, that is the reality. And legitimacy, and therefore authority, is slowly but surely leeching away from the UN system because the key executive decision-making body is the Security Council. Let me relate this to the nuclear issue uh, and finish with the second uh, comment in that. In the UN system, the Security Council represents the geopolitical center of gravity. The General Assembly is the normative center of gravity because it is the universal body. The NPT reflects the geopolitical balance of power of the late 1960s and early 1970s, the imbalance between non-proliferation and disarmament reflects the dominance, in particular, of the then Soviet Union and the United States, written into the NPT, and the five permanent members are the five nuclear weapon states, as per the NPT. The majority of the international community, including two-thirds of the NPT membership, has got increasingly exasperated 
with the slow progress on disarmament, increasingly conscious of the heightened dangers, nuclear threats and risks, and therefore reclaimed nuclear agency and has approved a treaty that will open for signature within a week in New York on a prohibition of nuclear weapons, whose primary intended effect is normative, not operational, to delegitimize, to stigmatize, and to prohibit, not to eliminate, but leading to elimination of nuclear weapons. This reflects the shift in the balance of power, the normative balance of power of the 21st century multipolar world. And it shows the extent to which the Security Council is now getting dangerously misaligned to the global currents. And that will impact its ability to be the chief guardian of international peace and security. So that was the second comment. Third comment, back to the theme of the panel, regional perspectives. It seems to me that we in Australia have accepted that increasingly our destiny, our future, lies in continued identification with the region in which we are geographically located. That is showing up in the changing demographics of the country. It is showing up in all sorts of flows across the breadth of issues. It is showing up in the reciprocal influences we are starting to exercise. And I remember, as, as you might have gathered, I've worked for many years very closely with Gareth Evans. One of the stories he is very fond of is at a meeting in Jakarta, as it happens, uh, whatever the meeting was, at one stage, the ASEAN foreign ministers went off and were in a room discussing something amongst themselves. And Gareth was looking for some other place and opened the door to that room by mistake. And making his apologies was retreating. And Ali Alatas said, Gareth, come on in. You really are one of us. Once we internalize that, and once the ASEAN and Asian countries in turn recognize that we have progressed to that point, I think the region will benefit to everyone's advantage. Thank you very much. Would you please join me in thanking us? Please?